September, the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Martial Law was commemorated around the country. Many of us have perhaps participated in these events and listened to the stories of survivors as they were recounted in many, many ways. Now, in the hope of continuing this important conversation, we launched today another significant body of work covering the different facets of the martial law era. I am aware that some of you have already made your pre-order, so may copy na kayo ng the Marcos era, our leader. So I'm holding my copy. Some of you already have your copy. The others, uh, the others, we will be making an announcement later on how you can avail of it uh, towards the end of our event today. The Marcos Era, a reader, is published by the Ateneo University Press. It contains critical essays from different scholars, mga historians, journalists, political scientists, pundits, lawyers, and economists. I must say sociologists too. I am a sociologist. Across generations, about the collective assessment of Ferdinand Marcos Sr.'s regime. Some of you might think that this is lawyers and economists across But this is in response to our contemporary political life. As one of the editors, Sileya Castaneda Anastasia, puts it in her foreword, the Marcos's return has evoked a complicated mix of emotions and occasion fears of the post-traumatic sort regarding uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Uh, might reinstate what he might reinstate from his father's time. So in this sense, no, um, napaka-hulugan, napaka-meaningful ng librong ito at pag-launch sa panahon na ito, 50 years since the first uh, the martial law uh, was declared by Ferdinand Marcos Sr. So what's the flow of our program in the rest of the afternoon? We're going to be hearing from the editors themselves. There are two of them, Simam Leia at Saka Sister Jojo. We're going to hear from them. We're also going to be hearing uh, from some of the authors about specific areas or events uh, during and about the martial law. And then we will have our panel discussion uh, with the editors and the contributors uh, during the Q&A. So this is a reminder to all of us, where uh, however you're uh, tuned in, whether on YouTube or Facebook Live, May I invite you all to put in your questions in the comment section. We're going to collate all of them, and we're going to try to cover all of them during the Q&A. Hopefully, you would be willing and brave enough, I hope, to share also your uh, thoughts about some of the things that you're going to hear from the editors themselves and the, and the contributors. Let's begin with the editors. We've got two editors. The first one is uh, Ma'am Lea, Lea Castaneda Anastasio who is a legal historian. We're going to hear from her first in the Philippine bar examinations. After graduating from the Ateneo de Manila University, she obtained her LLM and SJD degrees from Harvard University. An independent scholar and research fellow at Harvard Law School's East Asian Legal Studies Program, she's the author of The Foundations of the Modern State, Imperial Rule, and the American Constitutional Tradition, 1898 to 1935. Um, uh, Mamleya, would you like to go ahead now? Thank you, um, Jail. Um, so greetings, everyone. Good morning from my end. Good evening. Good afternoon, wherever you're in, you are in the world while viewing this book launch. I'm very happy and honored to be here and not just a little incredulous that this day has finally arrived. So from a marketing perspective, like Jail said, we, we probably couldn't have timed this book's publication better. By itself, the 50th um, anniversary of an event as momentous as the imposition of martial law, which inaugurated uh, one of the most dramatic, traumatic, and transformative periods in Philippine history, demanded remembrance and reflection. More commercially fortuitous, though not politically, was the Marcos dynasty's restoration last May. Needless to say, as Jael has also referenced, their comeback has raised popular fears and engendered fraught questions altering the tone and stakes of our project. What might otherwise have been a more academic exercise suddenly took on greater immediacy and urgency, more so in the light of the sprouting of alternative narratives, which arguably facilitated the once unthinkable return to power. So what surprised me while working on this collection was how little there was by way of a sustained systematic analysis of the Marcus era, much less a definitive synthesis of it. That dissonant accounts have sprouted is perhaps 
unsurprising given this paucity. Some of our authors, like Professors Aguilar and Pulong Bayan, have offered different theories explaining this lack. And perhaps part of the reason why competing accounts have successfully dislodged what was once conventional wisdom is that no master narrative had been sufficiently articulated and substantiated in the scholarship for the benefit of future generations. Perhaps there was not that much to supplant to begin with. For my part, I confess I learned a great deal working on an era that departs from my earlier focus on the Philippine legal history of the American period. At the same time, the Marcos years were not alien to me. Growing up a martial law baby, and I'm going to date myself here, I have pieced together my own personal experience with the experiences of people I knew, forming a consensus about what was commonly known among our circles, and that functioned as a sort of history. That said, those experiences, some of them, were powerful and formative, mainly my ties to the late um, Justice Cecilia Munoz Palma and our former university president, um, the late Father Joaquin Bernas. That piqued my, um, they piqued my lifelong curiosity regarding the coexistence of contradictories in Philippine law and politics, such as democracy with dictatorship, constitutionalism with absolutism. And this fueled my earlier efforts to trace their origins to the American period. But my story and the article that resulted from it is only a thread in this larger cloth. But by merging with studies of other threads from the Marcus years, we hope to weave an integrated and multi-layered story that begins to address the need for such a narrative. For this anthology is merely a beginning. Like most ventures, we had some sense of what was out there, but didn't know at the outset exactly what we would get. Hence, the conversation as metaphor, which is what we use to describe the book. This captures the fluidity and flexibility of our approach. We began by casting a wide net, knowing that the big picture that crystallizes and the perspectives that inform it will be determined by who shows up. Fortunately, we feel we've assembled a diverse collection that spans the um, regime's most crucial areas and analyzes the respective topics in depth and detail. Book ended by a foreword and an afterward, the anthology's organization took shape organically from the 18 submissions and is divided into six main sections, namely lineages, legal, political, economic, cultural, and legacies. The lineages section sets the stage and scope of our collaborative investigation by taking stock of its, of its subject and the resources available to make sense of his legacy. Manuel Quezon III derives a psychological sketch of Marcos from key phases in his life that provides keen insight into his makeup and motivations, while pointedly asking what it says about Filipinos and our culture that he was shaped by his time and milieu. Surveying the historiography, Filomena Aguilar flags significant works, but more exciting, points the way for future research into the yet untapped Marcos state and personal papers. Quezon's piece quotes Marcus as saying that Filipinos will accept any kind of radical reform provided it is constitutional and legal. In the first of two legal pieces, my piece um, sees this conviction play out in the elaborate um, constitutional justification devised by the martial law cases for the regime at its birth. Picking up at the regime's demise, uh, Roy Mendoza tracks the mostly unsuccessful attempts by human rights victims and the PCGG to hold the Marcuses legally accountable, their failure caused in part by inconsistent goals and strategies that undercut each other. Sustaining martial law required an existential threat to the state. The four political chapters look at the martial law state's allies and enemies. Crisel de Yabes probes Marcus's relationship with the military, its role in consolidating his rule, its politicization by its commander in chief, and resulting disillusionment and betrayal of him by its more professional elements. Thomas McKenna's piece on the MNLF and the Bangsamoro Rebellion, together with Marites Danguilan Vitug and Glenda Gloria's reconstruction of the Jabeda massacre, devote welcome attention to a neglected area, Mindanao generally, but the Muslim rebellion specifically. Strikingly, Giorgio has referred as, um, regards this rebellion as heralding the end of Marcus's rule. Finally, Mark Thompson recounts the emergence of the coalition of elites, he wittily terms the aircon opposition, 
that succeeded in toppling the dictatorship through people power. He tracks their fortunes under succeeding administrations until their eventual displacement under President Duterte and more decisively with Marcos Jr.'s re-election. Now, to justify extending his martial law powers beyond the immediate emergency, Marcos invoked the need to eradicate the roots of unrest in the country's intractable poverty. This set his development agenda, whose proponents and components are studied by the five economic articles. Teresa Encarnacion Tadem profiles the proponents, that is, the technocrats who were this agenda's architects and whose expertise lent the regime credibility in the international community, notably its lending circles. Lisandro Claudio, Eduardo Tadem, and Christian Coliantes analyze particular components, currency devaluation, rural development, particularly rice farming, and population management. They uncover an uneven record, with some, like monetary and population programs, adopting sound theories and practices and yielding some objectively good results, but with many more failures. For ultimately thwarting this agenda were non-technical factors like the external debt crisis, crony corruption, and Imelda Marcus's profligacy. J.C. Punang Bayan weighs this actual performance against the so-called golden age myths and provides a much-needed, though rarely heeded, corrective. But solving Philippine problems at their root transcended the economic. Rather, the project entailed a deeper social and cultural transformation one pursued by Marcus's new society. In the first of four cultural chapters, Michael Pante dissects the physical embodiment of this reformist vision in Metro Manila, which ironically, if accurately, reflected its contradictory outcomes, juxtaposing Imelda's glistening pet projects against squatter colonies and serving as site both for the couple's rise to power and their overthrow. Reckoning with the cultural power of religion, Jail Cornelio turns to the relationship between Christianity and the dictatorship. He identifies the uneasy stances adopted by the Catholic and Protestant churches towards the regime, but also locates in religion the, what he calls the wellspring of authoritarianism in Filipino culture. It is a wellspring that the Marcus couple effectively harnessed, as Vicente Rafael demonstrates in unpacking the powerful imagery they enlisted in their performances of authority, like the myths of Malakas and Maganda and their self-portrayal as the nation's father and mother. Paradoxically, Rafael shows father and mother upended as parents are by the youthful rebellion, in the, as we see in the youth, saw in the youth protests. The Marcos's carefully curated image is likewise unmasked by scandal. In her provocative piece on the Dovey Beams affair, Caroline Howe explores the role of exposés in politics. By revealing public performances to be a sham, they provoke laughter and ridicule, which corrode authority and contribute to its downfall. Finally, the Legacies articles discern this history's impact on the present. Carefully connecting the personnel and practices of Duterte's brutal drug war more remotely to the American period, but more immediately to the Marcus government's counterinsurgency operations, Sheila Coronel accounts for a persistent state of unrest, one she calls a forever war that continues both to shadow and support the modern Philippine state. Last and by no means least, Giorgio's Abinalysis afterward lines up Marcos Sr.'s overall record with what is currently known about Marcos Jr., and I leave him to elaborate on his intriguing comparisons. So although the picture that emerges is neither comprehensive nor completely cohesive, we nonetheless hope, to paraphrase George's recent um, Rappler interview, that by compiling and thematically integrating in a single volume some seminal articles that were published in different outlets, along with groundbreaking new pieces, we will have made the story of the Marcus years more accessible to readers, thereby sparking a necessary continuing conversation. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Leia, for giving us a comprehensive overview of the book. I think that gives us um, a sense of its wide coverage and hopefully nakatulong ito para sa lahat ng mga nasa audience natin na ma-appreciate yung bigat at yung lawak ng mga topics or mga paksa na pinag-uusapan sa librong ito. Thanks, Leia. We're going to turn to the other editor, uh, Giorgio Abinales. Let me introduce him now. 
Patricia Abinales, si Giorgio, as is known to many of us, is professor at the Department of Asian Studies at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. His latest book is Modern Philippines. But he is also the author of three other books also published by the Ateneo University Press, including Making Mindanao, Cotabato and Davao in the Formation of the Philippine Nation State. Number two, State Orthodoxy and History in the Muslim uh, Mindanao Narrative. And number three, State and Society in the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome uh, Professor Patricio Giorgio Abinanes. Sir Giorgio. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Joe, uh, JL. Uh, magandang gabi, magandang umaga. Magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. Uh, to mga Bisaya, may hapon din ta, daw ang mga mag-uto, mag-buntag. And to my Moro friends in Mindanao, wassalam alaikum. Um, Leia, I think, has ano, given the, the, the comprehensive gist on what the book is all about. Ang um, gagawin ko na lang is to give you an, uh, an, uh, sort of a brief background as to how this book came to be. As Leia mentioned, these are all seminal pieces in the sense that none of them really are comprehensive accountings of partial law. So what we did actually to say, well, if you look at these books, different, it works differently. Very few people will read them. Okay, you access nang all of you know that you know your print media, but the academic or non-academic will have very limited uh, audience. If you want to read, say, Mike Panty's article or Carol Howe or Jill Serrano's, you have to subscribe to Philippine Studies. Or if you know you want to read to the works of Mike Mark Thompson on Philippine democratization, you have to you know uh, open subscriptions to like journals of democracy. Or journals of critical Asian studies. So we decided, why don't we put them all together in one volume? No, you know, the only under, under in the basic theme is the Marcos era, a reader, and you know, uh, gave them, organized them into broad themes, and therefore, two things: one, help our readers, you know, have access to all of them, but also in the process then help them, especially the younger Filipinos, figure out which parts of the Marcos regime that needs to be understood. So yun ang unang reason. So bring pieces that would normally have very limited audience together in one piece, published in the Ateneo Press, which has a nationwide distribution, so that it could be accessible to many. Second, the, the reason the, the book is uh, we, Organized the book. We sent uh, uh, invitations to as many people as possible to contribute. Only 18 came back. Some said, we'll write something new. The others said, can you reprint these pieces? So it's a book that com uh, consists of original and reprints. But its authors are diverse to give you, therefore, audience an idea on the many kinds of smart people who are writing about and reflecting on Marcos. So we have journalists like Marit Bitog. Glenda Gloria, Chris Yabes, Manolo Quezon. Uh, for me, for example, uh, four of the top 10 journalists in the country. We have academics who are seniors and juniors, seniors like Vince Rafael, uh, Caroline Howe, yours truly, uh, <coughs> Vince and I, and uh, June Aguilar, for example, who live from martial law. But you also have young academics uh, that are you know, exploring the Marcos era from afar, but also in relation to their own ex uh, present experience. So Mike Pantheon, Quezon City, jail on relig religion beyond the Catholic Church, uh, JPC Punong Bayan on looking back at the Marcos economy in comparison to uh, regimes, and then Lele Claudio on liberalism, and Chris Colliantes on uh, uh, reproductive rights, among other things. So you have all senior scholars like Ed Tadem, who probably in the 70s was one of the best uh, the top scholars on Philippine agriculture. And in the 80s, late 70s, early 80s, uh, his partner, Tessa Tadem, uh, began this process of studying technocracy. And of course, you have Sheila, Sheila Coronel, who is now in Colombia, who's been studying <coughs> martial law violations, but also the profligacy of the Marcos era. We, so they had diverse topics, but the one thing I'm really proud of looking back is give and take three more men and you know, more three more men, but there is, I think we're proud of the gender balance of this collection. Uh, I personally am biased in, I personally believe that Filipina journalists, academics, and public intellectuals are far smarter than the men. 
end. You know? And so we're happy that some of our smartest journalists, academics, and intellectuals are in the collection. The final reason for the diversity is what brings them all together. Uh, the, school, the authors in this volume, one way or another, are public intellectuals. They don't consider themselves just as academics in ivory towers, but see their works as a continuing, continuing uh, discussion, conversation with their audience. Which brings me to the third point, which is the audience of this collection. We are really proud that we have authors who consider Filipinos as their primary audience. Uh, Tom McKenna, maybe an American, but Tom McKenna, when he writes, he always thinks of his Maguindanao audience. He's very fluent in Maguindanao, by the way. Uh, his uh, dissertation on the Maguindanao during the, M uh, the MNLF Nightmare Rebellion is still incomparable to this very day. So in a certain way, he's American, but he's more Maguindanao than many of us. Same with Mark Thompson, who I met in 1985 as this young guy from Texas who, uh, who went to Yale and wanted to study um, the, the non-communist opposition, ending up with the aircon opposition. If you get a chance to get drunk with Mark, his Tagalog actually is Quezon City, UP Tagalog. You know? Hello, pare. I mean, he talks like that. So he's much more, in the sense, more at home with the Philippines than any other. And even some of the you know, Filipinos I know. And you have people like Carol, Vince, and myself. Uh, Carol and I, when we were in Kyoto, we made a pact that whatever we write, we write for a Filipino audience. So I don't give a rat's ass about American audience, for example, in my case. It's always in Filipinos that I write my book to. I think Carol, too. And Vince, we have, for example, people like Vince and Mark may converse with the wider audience. But the one thing that's notable about Vince and Mark, for example, is that they go home. They go to the Philippines and present their ideas. And like people like Al McCoy, get ready to be criticized and challenged by Filipinos. The final point I'd like to share with you folks is that this is not a definitive, as Leia pointed out, a collection. Rather, it is a, a collection of seminal pieces, which hope we hope that in the future will be enriched by two things. One, the problem with the Marcos era because of censorship and because much of the Philippines was in a constant state of war, a lot of the memories about martial law are oral. So therefore, that part of martial law that we need to recover. I mean, the stories of our people, the stories of Muslims fighting, uh, fighting, fighting the military, uh, the stories of soldiers being drafted into the Ar Marcos army to fight Muslims, um, the stories of young students from University of Visayas, University of Philippines, Ateneo, you know, the non-edjup one, the non-leaders one suddenly finding themselves in the guerrilla army, uh, people ending up as Saudi workers because they had no jobs here people in the urban poor, you know, who've been moved around, forced around because Mrs. Marcos decided to make Manila the city of man, as it were. But these are the stories that we still need to collect. Um, and hopefully these stories and, and this collection will encourage young scholars, knock knock Michael Panty historians, to write a definitive, comprehensive history of martial law. Maraming salamat, dalang salamat. Salamat kayo, Sir Jojo, and thank you for giving us uh, the backstory and uh, all your motivations and intentions for uh, gathering the different scholars and journalists and public intellectuals that constitute uh, this important volume. So maraming maraming salamat for that. Uh, we are now receiving many comments uh, via Facebook Live and our YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Please keep them coming. We're going to entertain them shortly uh, during the Q&A. This is a reminder that we are live on the Facebook pages of Ateneo Press, Ateneo de Manila University, and Rappler. We are also on YouTube uh, via Ateneo's uh, official channel. Again, this is a reminder and encouragement to all of us to please don't forget to put in your questions and comments. We are already seeing and compiling all of them. I am already seeing on Twitter questions about its availability, for example. We're going to be giving you answers uh, towards the end of our event. So maraming salamat sa mga editors natin, kay Leia at kay Jojo. Now, in the next couple of minutes, we're going to turn to the contributors themselves. So we have, we're so privileged to have about three contributors 
to explain to us uh, their uh, narratives, you know, their stories, their contributions to the conversation, as it were. We heard the word conversation a couple of times from Leia and Jojo. And let's now hear from the contributors themselves. Ano yung mga ambag nila sa conversation na ito? We have three contributors, uh, one historian, uh, one journalist, and one economist. Simula natin kay Michael Pante. Si Michael Pante ay isang associate professor sa Department of History sa Ateneo de Manila University. Siya rin ang chief editor of Philippine Studies, Historical and Ethnographic Viewpoints. He's the author of A Capital City at the Margins, Quezon City and Urbanization in the 20th Century Philippines, published in 2019 by the Ateneo de Manila University Press. Michael, it's your turn. Maraming salamat, Jail, at maraming salamat sa mga nanonood sa atin ngayong hapon. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Leia and Jojo for including me in this very important project. Ngayon, yung chapter na meron ako dito sa librong ito, I titled it Metropolitan Trauma. And I want to uh, just uh, say that uh, the inspiration behind this title uh, was uh, from uh, the scholar Nefertita Diar. And... Uh, I want to begin this uh, short talk by uh, reading uh, a portion of uh, the chapter that I lifted from Neferti Tadyar. And so I quote Tadyar, uh, you can see it on page 329 of the book. I quote Tadyar, in the 1980s, the running joke went, uh, gas, rice, sugar, everything is going up. The only things coming down are panties. Uh, so medyo nakakarelate pa tayo dahil uh, sa kasagsagan ng inflation. <laughs> itong mga uh, nagdaang araw uh, at, at magpahanggang ngayon o kaya nararamdaman pa rin natin yan so parang parang hindi na, parang hindi nawala yung martial law uh, but then again i also want to i i try to juxtapose okay this uh, uh, oppression of women okay, by looking at other instances of oppression and i try to compare that with a uh, i try to compare it with a uh, with a film that was uh, produced in 1984 Ishmael Bernal's Working Girls. And so the following paragraph reads, Women's liberation, that seemed to be the clarion of Bernal's 1984 film, Working Girls, which depicted the economic mobility of the women of Makati's CBD. However, closer to reality was the hackneyed phrase used to shush housewife Amanda Bartolome in Luwalhati Bautista's novel, Decada Setenta, It's a Man's World. Marcosian misogyny perme permeated even the privacy of homes. The dictator was, of course, the Philippines' philanderer in chief. And so my, my chapter in this book is filled with uh, a lot of these uh, allusions to uh, popular culture in the, in the martial law era, as well as uh, other aspects, other social aspects uh, that uh, were, were part of uh, Metro Manila okay, under the martial law regime. Uh, normally, when we, when we read materials, uh, academic works about the martial law period, especially focusing on Metro Manila, we, we tend to have a kind of di dichotomous picture. Okay? On, the, on the one hand, we have uh, Imelda's uh, splendor, uh, the, the gigantic architecture, the edifice complex, uh, and the corruption involved in all of it. Uh, so on the, on the one hand, you have that. Okay? Since Imelda was the governor, uh, the governor of Metro Manila at that time. And then on the other hand, you have uh, poverty. Okay, you have, uh, you, you could even say, para may stark contrast okay, between Imelda's uh, figure as a woman vis-a-vis -vis the figure of the woman of another Ishmael Bernal film in Shang. So urban poverty, prostitution, slums, uh, criminality, and all that. Uh, Yes, I also tackle those things okay, in my chapter. But at the same time, I also want to see what was the things that were happening in between. Okay? Uh, in, the, in the same way, I, 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 don't, I, I also don't want to uh, sanitize uh, the, 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 a lot of the bad things bad thing that happened in Manila, Metro Manila at that time. Uh, pero maganda rin pag-usapan yung mga bagay-bagay na kaya hindi masyadong makukulay na the black and white. And so I divide my chapter into seven parts. Uh, first, I tried to look at the formation of the metropolis under martial law. Metro Manila was formed, uh, established as a juridical entity in 1975, uh, which now includes like, those 16 cities and one municipality that we now call the National Capital Region. And it's followed by the section talking about 
email does email defect domain. So we we have we, we we are all familiar with that. CCP, kay the boutique the boutique hospitals, na yung Pilipino, the entire edifice complex. But after the second after the second section, I proceed to narrating some of lesser known uh, aspects, uh, the not so serious side of Metro Manila during uh, martial law, such as uh, the third section, which focuses on soundscapes and nightscapes. I try to include into my discussion uh, how the VST and company uh, was, a, was a crucial uh, element in understanding uh, Metropolitan Manila, how original Filipino music or OPM helped sanitize the regime. Uh, but at the same time, uh, these soundscapes uh, had to compete with other forms of uh, sonic elements in the city, such as the roaring of the trains of the LRT, or perhaps uh, other, uh, other elements that uh, haunted the senses, like uh, uh, the smell of piss in the city's pockets of sleaze, uh, nondescript buildings, beer houses, uh, coexisting with Bible study sessions, uh, takatak boys yelling cigarillo, juicy, Stuff like that. And then the next section proceeds to uh, looking at the fragmented metropolis. How Metro Manila was not just Manila. Yes, Manila was the dominant city, but there were other uh, cities involved. Uh, what about uh, cities neglected in the narrative such as San Juan, okay, where the G-liner, also known back then as Gapang Liner, or its glacial pace, uh, how do we include that in the narrative? How, does it, how did it compete with the love bus? Uh, why did people call uh, tap water back then Nawasa juice? Or what about the pockets of dissent in Cubao? Uh, and then the preceding chapter, uh, preceding section rather, uh, I look at the, uh, the scenes behind the glitz and glamour. I look at Tatalon, I look at Smoky Mountain, the workers' strike at SM, uh, the Constitution Hills, which was eventually named Batasan Hills, and how it became, ironically, the biggest slum area in the city. But of course, I don't neglect uh, the pockets of unrest uh, the first quarter storm, the Diliman Commune, uh, the university belt being turned into a battleground, uh, the geographic clustering of these schools, all of which were just a pillboxes throw away from Menjola, uh, which we are all aware uh, was one of the key uh, flashpoints of a conflict between the Metrocom and student activists at that time. And then I end with, uh, of course, EDSA, part of Metro Manila, uh, and how it figured in the, the downfall of the dictator. To end my short talk, I want to quote once again Neferti Tadyar. Uh, as Tadyar puts it, Metro Manila is traumatic in two senses. It is a traumatic experience, and it is the product of the historical trauma of martial law. Maraming salamat sa pakikinig, and I hope you get yourself a copy of the book. Maraming maraming salamat, Mike. What an apt way to end your presentation. Metro Manila as a, a traumatic experience and a product of our historical trauma. Maraming maraming salamat for that powerful reminder from a historian that is Mike Pante. Pakinggan naman natin ng isang batikang journalist. Marites uh, Vitug um, is one of the Philippines' most accomplished and awarded journalists, widely recognized for her Reportage on Politics, Justice, and Security. A best-selling author, she has written several books on Philippine current affairs, the most recent of which, I'm very sure you're aware of this, is Rock Solid, How the Philippines Won Its Maritime Case Against China, published by the Ateneo Press in 2018. Uh, of course, she's the editor at large of Rappler, a leading news website, and former editor-in-chief of Newsbreak, a pioneering investigative magazine. Mamarites, your turn. Uh, <clears throat> Hello, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first, a word of thanks to our editors, Jojo Abinales and Leia Castaneda Anastasio. Uh, they are giving our story on the Jabida massacre a new lease on life, reaching out to a wider audience, especially the younger generation who may not have read or heard about these gruesome killings that then President Marcos and his select group of military officers tried to keep secret. A friend and colleague, Glenda Gloria and I, wrote this in 1999, when all of us were much younger, untouched by COVID. This was the opening, of, opening chapter of our book Under the Crescent Moon, Rebellion in Mindanao, which was published a year later in 2000. 
the original publishers, the Ateneo Center for Social Policy and Public Affairs, and the Institute for Popular Democracy are no longer around, and the book has been out of print for ages. So what a thrill that our chapter in the name of honor is once more seeing the light of day in this timely book, The Marcos Era, A Reader. It is a useful guide in remembering, like a memory map. So what was the Jabida massacre all about, and why is it important? If the Plaza Miranda bombing in 1971 stoked the fires of protests in Manila and elsewhere, the Jabida massacre of 1968 was the spark that lit the Muslim rebellion, the embers of which we are still seeing today. But this chapter in the annals of our history will continue to have missing parts. At the time Glenda and I were doing our research, the major actors were already dead, but we were able to talk to senior military officers and men, both retired and in active service then. We were also able to interview some civilians who were part of the group trained by the, by the military, including a survivor of the massacre, Jibin Arula, who passed away in 2011. One of us visited Tawi-Tawi to get a sense of what happened on the ground since Tawi-Tawi was a major source of recruit, recruits for this special operation. For documentary sources, we went over Senate transcripts of the 11, 11 hearings that probed the massacre, as well as various news reports. In essence, here's what happened. At least 23 Muslim men trained by the military in a special commando unit were killed in Corregidor. They planned to launch a mutiny against the military officers supervising them because they were not paid, as promised, and their food was measly. But their plan was uncovered, thus they were forever silenced. A group in the military was involved in the, in the cover-up. So anywhere, anywhere from 135 to 180 men were trained in Corregidor, and they were mainly from Tawi-Tawi and Sulu. About 62 of them secretly wrote a letter to then President Marcos complaining of their miserable situation. This reached the officer in charge in Corregidor, and the signatories were disarmed and considered resigned. Others were sent back to Sulu and Tawi Tawi, and there were two dozen men unaccounted for. What was their mis the mission of this clandestine operation? It was to destabilize, infiltrate, and take over the resource-rich island of Saba. Marcos and his men believed that this Borneo island belonged to the Philippines. At the time, it was a fragile period for Malaysia as the Federation of Malaysia was born only a few years earlier in 1963. Then Singapore broke away in 1965 and also Malaysia was em embroiled in a border dispute with Indonesia. Preparation for the mission included the entry to Saba of a team of civilian recruits, again from Sulu and Tawi-Tawi. They were supposed to use psychological warfare to convince Filipino residents there to form a movement with the aim of seceding from Malaysia and joining the Philippines. This situation would then force the Philippine government to either take full control of the island or the residents themselves would secede. So why the name Jabida? Jabida is the name of a beautiful woman in Muslim lore. Jabida may have referred to Saba, likened to a woman desired by the group of trainees. Three factors converged and became the context and backdrop for the planned invasion of Saba. The fear of a planned is of a pan-Islamic movement creeping into Mindanao, a vulnerable federation and an anti-smuggling operation planned by the military. Eventually, all officers and men charged in the military court for the Jabida massacre were acquitted. Of course, you can read more details about the Jabida massacre in the Marcos era, a reader. Just a bit of background on what happened after the, the Jabida massacre was exposed. Malaysia provided refuge to the Muslim rebels belonging to the MNLF and aided them with arms and military training. 
the Philippine government did not revive its claim over Saba. Then President Marcos announced during an ASEAN summit in 1977, held in Kuala Lumpur, his intention to drop the Saba claim in the spirit of regional cooperation. Recently, there have been efforts to whitewash this historical event, some even calling it fake news. I wonder who would benefit from this campaign. Clearly, the Marcoses. They stand to gain if we erase the Jabida massacre from our history. It, be, it would be like killing our memory. Thank you for listening, and we, I hope that you all get a copy of the book. Bye. Thank you. Maraming salamat, Marites. Not yet a goodbye, kasi babalik ka pa during the open <laughs> forum. <laughs> o masyadong magmatali. Right? But, uh, but thank you so much for reminding us of what happened uh, during um, in the, in the, during the Jabida massacre and in the wake of, uh, of, of this um, unfortunate and really tragic event in our history that has already been uh, labeled as a, as a fake story or fake news. Um, we're going to come back to the whole point of fake news later on during the open forum. We're getting questions regarding that particular point. Which again, is a reminder to us all, an encouragement to us all, kung may mga katunungan po kayo, or may mga comments, or may mga thoughts, um, um, please feel free to share uh, them with us via our Facebook Live or YouTube uh, live stream. Uh, our colleagues are already collating them in preparation for our open forum immediately after our last uh, presenter. We turn to our last presenter, walang iba kundi si uh, uh, Dr. John Carlo Punumbayan, a uh, colleague and friend of mine, and uh, an economist. Uh, many of you might be very familiar with his writings and, and are actively engaging uh, him on social media. Si JC ay isang assistant professor at ang director ng graduate studies sa UP School of Economics, UPSD. He's also a regular columnist of the online news site Rappler and co-founder co -founder of Usapang Econ, a group of economists advocating economic literacy in the Philippines. His first book, False Nostalgia, The Marcos Golden Age Myths and How to Debunk Them, is forthcoming from the Ateneo Press. JC, your turn. Thank you so much, Jail, and good evening, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Jojo and Leia for roping me in in this uh, very timely and significant project. For a young academic like myself, it's a dream come true to join this anthology alongside many of my academic, uh, journalistic, and literary idols and heroes. For the Marcos era, a reader, I wrote about the Marcos Golden Age myths. You will know, of course, that this is a huge body of narratives that attempt to characterize the Marcos years as no less than the country's golden age a time of unprecedented prosperity and growth. And these narratives have played a colossal role in the politi pol political comeback of the Marcoses over the decades, culminating in the historic win of Marcos Jr. in May. But these, these myths are totally at odds with economic record, as manifested in the huge corpus of data and the studies that um, have been written by economists and analysts before. I've been writing and speaking about this topic for the past six years or so, and this afternoon, let me share with you how to debunk these myths using data. And I'll also draw some emerging parallels with the economy right now under the time of uh, Marcos Jr. So I have a number of slides to just, uh, uh, yeah, can we, can we flash? There we go. Thank you so much. So Marcos Golden Age Myths. The, one of the most prominent myths out there is that the country was the richest, well, the, the, actually the richest in Asia during martial law. But when you look at the economic record, actually even as early as 1965, other countries were already richer than us in terms of GDP as well as GDP per person. And uh, over time, the list of richer countries has only grown. And this only attests to the fact that uh, actually we have lagged behind significantly in the region over the decades uh, of martial law. This uh, graph illustrates that point as well. You can see uh, how flat the uh, increase of uh, per person incomes in the Philippines uh, has been compared to other ASEAN countries. 
um, to the point that actually uh, Malaysia overtook us as early as the late uh, 1960s, uh, Thailand in the mid-1980s, as well as Indonesia in the late 1980s as well. So only Lao PDR, Vietnam, Myanmar, and Cambodia are poorer than us now. Um, apologies for my dog, <laughs> which is uh, uh, having her, her zoomies uh, right now. Uh, but you can see uh, just how much we have fallen behind in the years uh, during martial law. So we have to ask the question, um, how come uh, we lag behind uh, when in fact uh, we, were, uh, we were the leader of Asia back in the 1950s and 1960s? We also experienced the country's worst post-war recession during martial law. Uh, GDP uh, actually uh, went down by uh, almost 14% in 1984 and 1985. That is actually still the worst economic crisis that we uh, experienced, uh, even beating the decline uh, due to COVID-19. Because um, in 2020, the economy plummeted by just 9.6%. Uh, during martial law, we also saw uh, record unemployment as well as underemployment. Uh, one out of three people in the labor force uh, were underemployed. So basically, um, they were not content with the wages and salaries that they were getting and they wanted to work more or needed an extra job just to get by. Because of the poor labor market conditions, um, the share of OFWs in the population grew by more than nine times from 1975 until 1983. Um, including actually my parents who went to the U.S. Uh, in the aftermath of uh, the Marcos dictatorship because of the poor labor market conditions. It took us two decades to recover from the economic downturn uh, wrought by martial law. So in 1982, uh, GDP per person peaked and uh, it dropped significantly and we did not recover the same level until 2003 or more than two decades later. Imagine just how high uh, per-person incomes could have been if we had not experienced the downturn due to martial law. So this is called the lost decades of Philippine development. Another prominent myth is that um, the uh, peso was very strong uh, against the U.S. dollar back in the day, as strong as 1.5 or 2 pesos per U.S. dollar. The peso was strong, but in fact, it was not as strong as 1.5 or 2. Uh, when uh, Marcos Sr. was first elected um, as president, uh, in December 1965, uh, the exchange rate was already at 3.9 uh, pesos per U.S. dollar. And over time, throughout the Marcos years, uh, the uh, peso only depreciated. Um, this is actually um, a legacy of the previous administrations, uh, which uh, deliberately made the peso very strong in order, in order to promote imports uh, that will be used to uh, promote domestic manufacturing. But even with an artificially strong peso, the Marcos administration failed to promote export growth. Um, uh, you can see here that compared to, for example, South Korea, Thailand, and Malaysia and Indonesia, which really took off during these years, we lagged behind significantly. So that strategy did not work. And the peso, very strong peso, was not uh, sustainable. Another big body of golden age myth would actually revolve around the uh, infrastructure projects that were built during that time. But many were actually not very productive and uh, were some, actually many were outright wasteful as found by uh, UP economists in their uh, seminal um, white paper back in 1984. And many of these projects were designed to secure a politi political constituency to get a commission or to corner a contract. And uh, many were used uh, as a vehicle for private gain, whether pecuniary or political. Uh, but uh, the, the more important point uh, when, it, when you talk about the infrastructure projects is that many of them were built on the back of the irresponsible debt accumulation of the Marcos administration. Uh, so between 1965 and 1985, the Philippines' total external debt grew by $23.52 billion. So you can just imagine how difficult it was to repay all of that, and it took us decades to do so. Um, in 1983, um, it came to the point that we declared a debt moratorium, basically telling the world and our creditors that we could no longer pay our debts. And um, you can see here from this graph that the international reserves of the Philippines really dwindled in the 70s and the early 80s, to the point that um, the uh, former central bank governor, Jaime Laya, was discovered to have padded the statistics when it comes to international reserves. He padded it by about uh, $600 million, and when this was discovered by the IMF, 
uh, it only prolonged our negotiations with our creditors to restructure our debt. Um, the central bank also lost a colossal 300 billion pesos because uh, it was also instructed by Marcos Sr. to lend to many of the businesses of the cronies using so-called behest loans. Another myth is that the Marcos regime fought the oligarchs. But uh, as we know, uh, they built for themselves an ecosystem of oligarchs themselves uh, through crony capitalism. Um, Imelda Marcos was quoted in, a, in this inquiry interview having said, uh, we practically own everything in the Philippines. And they seem to be a bit proud of that point. <laughs> and of course, we have uh, uh, the record when it comes to uh, the ill-gotten wealth of the Marcoses, the Guinness World Record for the greatest robbery of a government. No need to belabor that point. Another myth is that nobody went hungry during the martial law years. But in fact, the Philippines experienced its highest inflation rate of 50% in 1984. So if we're having trouble right now with 6.9 inflation, imagine how hard life was during martial law. And for many of us, um, actually, uh, you don't have to imagine that. Alongside the very high inflation is the rapid decline of the purchasing power of the peso. Your 100 pesos back in 1965 uh, was only worth 8.1 pesos by 1985, or the last full year of Marcos Sr. in office. Real wages also went down because of uh, tremendous inflation starting uh, in 1970, and this led to much social unrest. Also, uh, poverty worsened, as you can imagine. So uh, between 1971 until 1985, there were 2, two million more fil poor Filipi uh, Filipino families uh, because of the economic crisis. And then, of course, you have the uh, um, Negros Island famine, where every fifth child on the island under age of six was found to be seriously malnourished. And then, of course, they're claiming that Nutriban is their project, when in fact it was a, um, U an, a USAID project, actually. Now, clearly not the golden years of the Philippines. And uh, we have to contrast that with what's happening right now in the second Marcos administration. And the first thing to say is that actually a lot of things have changed in, since EDSA and the, the martial law years. For example, we're not an agricultural economy or not as reliant on agriculture uh, as before. So uh, as you can see here, the share of agriculture to a GDP has uh, really dwindled over the decades. And we're really a service-driven economy. Um, in 1970, more than half of people who have worked uh, are can be found in agriculture, but uh, right now it's only down to one out of five people. And um, more than half of our workers right now are in services. The middle class has really ballooned over the years, um, and the proportion of poor families has dwindled. But you can see as well the rising share of vulnerable people in our economy. But the middle class, for example, uh, is almost half of the number of total households in the country. We also experience inflation right now, but for different reasons, and not as high as 50%, as I pointed uh, out uh, earlier. And uh, the debt actually is actually uh, a lot more manageable right now, uh, insofar as uh, uh, it's really mostly uh, domestic loans, uh, domestic borrowings, compared to external uh, debt. Uh, but actually, we can already draw some parallels between uh, Marcos Sr. and Marcos Jr., where the economy is concerned. For example, uh, both of them have emphasized agriculture issues, um, uh, Marcos Sr., uh, his policies, uh, for example, the NFA, Kadiwa, Nutriban, all of these are having a comeback uh, with the uh, Marcos Jr. administration. The oligarchs are still around, as well as their descendants. Um, the reliance on technocrats, uh, the president is very proud uh, having uh, uh, hired uh, some of the best and brightest. Uh, in fact, that's what, what, that, that is what he's saying um, as uh, one of his achievements in the past 100 days, in the first 100 days. Heavy use of disinformation, historical denialism, as well as propaganda, and then the luxurious and ostentatious lifestyle. So there are several parallels that you can already draw from, uh, well, draw between Marcos Jr. and Marcos Sr. Um, but uh, of course, uh, we should never forget what had happened in the first Marcos administration. Uh, and uh, well, uh, that is a subject of my uh, chapter in the book. So please read that. Uh, as Rayil mentioned, uh, I have an upcoming book in February all about the Marcos economy, so please watch out for that. I have this newsletter where I try to chronicle the, uh, uh, the, what's happening in the Philippines uh, in the second Marcos administration, the Never Forget Diary. You can subscribe to that. 
Uh, we also have uh, something uh, in Usapang Econ Podcast. We have uh, episodes about uh, martial law economics. And then on Twitter, let's continue the conversation there. Thank you so much. Galing. Maraming maraming salamat, JC. Very accessible, very comprehensive. And I'm, I can imagine many of our those in the audience will be very excited to read your chapter as well. Maraming salamat, JC. All right. Maraming salamat kay Lea, kay Jojo, kay Marites, kay Mike, uh, kay JC. Thank you so much. Really, I, I know that um, uh, it took us a while to get together and finally we are here uh, compiling the book and all the volume and all that. Um, maraming maraming salamat really for all these contributions and the conversations that we're having today. We've got time, about 20 minutes or so, for our open forum. Um, we are collating all the questions right now and the comments from YouTube and uh, Facebook Live. So those of you who are tuning in right now, may I encourage you, we want to encourage you to put in your questions and comments. Um, we are collating them, um, and we want to discuss them, um, especially including the negative ones. I'm getting some feedback also uh, on social media. I'm going to be raising some of them to our panelists. Let's start with the editors. Uh, Sir Jojo, Mamlea, I heard the word and we heard the word conversations quite a lot, you know, in the uh, in the past hour, you know, since we began our uh, our our book launch. What exactly, what sort of conversations uh, did you have in mind, you know, when you uh, brought us together, the different contributors? And what, what do these conversations mean and look like um, beyond this uh, this edited volume. Napaisip ako dun sa tanong na yan, Sir Jojo Mamlea, precisely because of what JC has done just now. Really, he presented us with facts, right? Debunking the myths with facts. Are the conversations that you have in mind really just about the presentation of facts? Or did you have something else in mind? Maganda siguro simulan natin doon and maybe our, our uh, audience will also, and maybe Marites and Michael also have some some thoughts on that matter. Leia, did you want to start or Jojo? Si, si Leia na lang. Sige. <laughs> Sige, Leia. Leia, Leia, you want to start? Yeah, start, okay. Uh, and then Jojo. I guess speaking for myself, um, I'm guilty of being, uh, I guess, one of those people who relied mostly on experience. Like, I, I mean, I grew up during that time, so there was a lot that I, sh- that I assumed that I knew. But I think there was a need for something that was more formal, you know, more systematically presented. So that was the kind of conversation I wanted with a lot of expertise backing it up and evidence um, so that it would not so be so easily dismissed. I guess this, um, the counter narratives, the pro- what strikes me about them um, nowadays is that they seem to carry equal weight. And, um, and it's so hard, I guess, to persuade um, you know, people who aren't familiar with the history, not, you know, not having lived through it, um, yes. to yeah, to debunk that. So, for I guess that was what I thought, I what I was, I was hoping for to get um, a well substantiated, well argued pieces, um, and I guess well contextualized as well. Um, and f- yeah, so I guess that's that's in general that's what I was hoping to see. Mm-hmm. Jojo, as a historian, do you share the um, same thought, same opinion, or? Yeah, I think um, the purpose, the main purpose for me actually for this coming with a pro- project like this is to say, what kind of smart pieces have been written by people in different uh, professions, different disciplines, different areas, different locations about martial law. Uh, mm-hmm. For me, of course, having written much of Mindanao, my big bias is, of course, to say, in the the story of Marshall has never been complete unless you tell the story of the moral struggle. You tell the story of how Marcos transformed Mindanao from a rainforest dead area into a deep, uh, an island frontier whose resources now being depleted. So. And for me, it's also like having grown up in martial law and having realized that there's still so much to be told about it. 
partly, oh. you know, if you come from the south, you know, from the center, you see a lot of these stories that have never really become part of the conversation. And ironically, being here in Hawaii, I have Filipino students whose children who's curious about why their parents left the Philippines. And some of them said, uh, kasi ayaw mahuli, sir. I, they don't want to be arrested according to them. So this curiosity of the next generation, like wow. what did my father and my grandfather do? And the fear that eventually my daughter would say, you know, what did you do when you were in your, se- in your 20s? That story has to come to fore, you know. And you have that. A lot of the victims of martial law, for example, are writing their memoirs now. Uh, yeah. And I think the more things, the more, you know, uh, things written about that era, which is equivalent to a longer ge- period of World War II, no? That's our first, uh, what, second traumatic experience as a society, um, prompted me to sort of like, can we get these people together and, you know, ask right. them if they could write? Or like, yeah. So that basically, it, more stories, the better. Oh, Marites, I see you're not. I see you nodding. You've been an investigative journalist for a long, long time. So, mga conversations nato. Sino ang kausap mo as a writer? No, actually, meron na kung uh, uh, I was surprised because in the election campaign, I spoke to a few millennials and young people. And I asked them where they thought about martial law. Did they read about the Marcuses? Nagulat ako na hindi sila, they didn't um, have a course. Even part of their history course daw, wala. Uh, walang, hindi, hindi nag-delve deep into martial law. So I asked them, how did you know about martial law? Kasi mukhang mulat naman sila. From their parents, um, from friends, and from a few select teachers. Hindi kasi required readings yung mga uh, books on the Marcoses and martial law. And of course, alam na natin na uh, yung mga required, yung mga textbooks, they glossed over martial law. Meron pa ngang two pages lang. Uh, and then yung iba, pinupuri pa. So dun ako na, actually I was shocked kasi I, I'm, a, I'm not a martial law baby because I was... <clears throat> in college already when martial law was declared. So, nagunat lang ako na hindi nila alam. So, sana we can learn from this and yeah. sana ma, mas maging aware yung ating educators. Uh, ewan ko lang ngayon dahil yung secretary natin ng DepEd, hindi ko alam kung priority itong memory, you know, learning about yeah. the past and the memory kasi Iba naman yung priorities, but I really realized na ganun pala ka-importante. So tuwang-tuwa ako dito sa Marcos Reader. I hope really that students, younger people get to read it, and those who get to read it can uh, use it, can amplify it through TikTok, YouTube, and it's so rich, napaka-rich ng libro. So uh, yun lang ang hope ko. Yeah. No, thank you for pointing that out, Marites. Kasi, um, meron ko si tayong isang comment dito. Medyo negative siya. Almost antagonistic. You can imagine kung kanino po si potentially galing ito. Sabi niya, nothing interested. Mag-online selling na lang kami. Uh, wala kami makukuha sa narrative lang ninyo. Problema ito ng mga historians. Problema natin ito as public intellectuals. Diba? Na parang may nakikinig ba sa atin. Ikaw, Mike, as a historian, and you belabor the point, you give all the details, napaka-comprehensive ng presentation mo about space, meron ka pang sonic dimension, and so forth. Um, uh, does anyone listen? Does anyone? Does anyone? Hindi ba yun yung problema ng historical distortion right now? Hindi ko sa echo chamber in a way. How would you deal with that, Mike? Yes, uh, yun nga siguro talaga yung problema. We, we, we're not even sure if people are listening. And I think uh, meron na talaga nga na yung automatic shutdown uh, uh, coming from coming from these people na once they get to hear certain words, certain topics, yes. manner of speaking, or I- identified with a certain affiliation, institution, pag nakita nila yun, parang automatic, it shuts down na kahit ano pang sabihin mo, even how articulate you are, uh, kahit na ang ganda ganda ng pagkakalatag ng facts mo, di ba, uh, one primary source over the other, it, it doesn't really matter. Parang once na alam nila na you are you are part of the other camp, 
it's it parang mas shutdown na so i i guess uh i i don't know if this will be a successful attempt on my part but i think that's one of the reasons why i tried to be uh as non academic uh doon sa chapter ko which was to present other other angles kasi pag kunwari i i give them the usual first quarter storm uh yung mga rallies etc parang ano na yun, automatic na yun sa kanila ah, ah hindi kami hindi kami makikinig and so i try to include in my discussions yung mga bagay na hindi masyado napapads like for example OPM uh, and how the Marcos has utilized OPM as a way to legitimize the regime so baka baka ganun ko kunwari I, I begin with something na hindi masyadong quote on quote political maybe they will begin to listen hopefully hopefully wow wow in you know, Galing na, that's a very useful strategy. Medyo napaisip din ako doon kasi I work in the yung contribution ko is really about religion and politics and how religion um, is really deeply implicated in all of this, diba? And sometimes religion, you know, church, uh, they also echo all this, um, sometimes this uh, historical distortions lalo na sa mga certain right-wing pastors or even ministers, no? Um, and presenting them with facts as JC did just now Sometimes does not work, eh. or does it work in your case, JC? Now, okay, actually, ito po yung mga graphs, ito yung mga tables. Does it work? Yung ganon. Sometimes I wonder if presenting people with facts is the best way to deal with distortions. Yes, JC. Um, struggle ko talaga yan, <laughs> kasi uh, marami na rin mga pag-aaral na nagpapakita na kung yun nga pakita mo lang ng facts, ay talaga nagsa shutdown yung mga tao. So in my case, for example. Um, actually, maraming paraan eh. For example, yung pagsusulat in Filipino, which I have yeah. I have been doing uh, for my Rappler pieces since last year. Um, actually, dumaming readership ko napansin ko. So, marami namang nagbabasa. For example, if you uh, talk to them um, in the vernacular, in in Filipino, uh, mas mauunawaan eh. And aside from that, meron mga paraan para, para mas maunawaan pa. For example, yung paggamit ng mga analogy. Uh, for example, yung inflation. Paano mo ipapaliwanag yung inflation? Uh, pwede mong sabihin na uh, uh, hindi mo sila sasabihan ng mga statistics per se, pero for example, uh, lumiliit yung pandesal. O di kaya yung uh, nabibili mo sa grocery ay pakonti ng pakonti. Yung grocery bag mo ay pagaan ng pagaan. O yung uh, napapagas mo sa, uh, na diesel o gasolina, pakonti ng pakonti. So may mga analogy, may mga strategy na pwede gamitin. Pero at the same time, I realize na Iba na rin talaga yung information ecosystem na ginagalawan natin. So, nandiyan yung algorithms na talagang sila ang nagdidikta kung ano yung nakikita natin sa mga feed natin, sa, pla- sa TikTok, sa Facebook, sa kung ano man. And uh, I shared the sentiments of Maria Ressa of Rappler na hanggang hindi maayos yung ganong klaseng algorithms ay talagang patagal pa itong spell of talagang uh, accelerating and uh, ballooning in this information. Eh. Pero uh, that is not to say na kailangan na natin i-give up yung ganitong klaseng conversations. And uh, siguro, um, on, siguro parallel doon sa ating mga online conversations, dalhin din natin sa labas ng mga social yeah. media platforms yung conversation. Alam mo, ganda ng point na yan, JC, sa kasi Mike, kasi meron ako natanggap sa Twitter, sa, sa DM ko, uh, yun mismo ang iniisip niya, no? Um, he was thinking about how we get the info out to those who are most vulnerable, quote-unquote, to miss or disinformation and historical revisionism. So those are very important points that you raised there. May follow-up question para kay Sir Jojo. Sir Jojo, ang follow-up question, in your Rappler interview, you said, never again will not work anymore. But does the book, by bringing together these different perspectives in one volume, not a never again approach? Hindi ba parang you're contradicting yourself? I think kung patamang pagkaintindi ko doon sa tanong niya. No, when I, uh, when Jan, when I explained it to Jan, Jan, ano, uh, uh, Janelle, is that the slogan of never again, if applied to Bongbong Marcos, will not work. Kasi the situation has changed. No? In fact, ironically, this is a very stable political system now. It's a system that's dominated by political clans. Okay? This is the exact opposite to what his father wanted. So, dun sa, sa afterwards, sabi ko, uh, the Ferdinand I uh, was fight, fighting for a centralized state, which did him eventually. But Ferdinand II is comfortable with, with and within a weak state. So, new context, sabi ko. The never again now has become decentralized. 
it has to have crisis has to come from the local level when political clans either kill each other or are challenged by reformist and revolutionary forces. So that's the first point. The second, but, but in this book, however, is mm -hmm. to also show na yung 15 years of martial law has its own distinct history that we haven't really completely studied yet. Kasi, yun nga, wala pang textbook. But also, ngayon lang lumalabas yung mga data na hindi accessible sa panahon namin, no? Marites, the Marites were in the word business day, they always had to tow a fine line. I remember this, eh. You know, you have to read, when you read Marites Vitog in 1982, 83, you have to really figure out what she's trying to say. Kasi inaaresto sila ni Enrile. <laughs> yung mga women journalists were subjected by, you know. Uh, pero ngayon, lumalab, malab, marami nang lumabas. We can more talk, there's more data now there to talk about the Marquesas. Now, if that person does, is not interested, mamimili na lang siya, I don't care. Because there's already another, what, 80 million Filipinos who might be interested in it, di ba? Um, so, para sa akin, itong Libro Network is, personally, it's my dealing with my past. Okay, I grew up under martial law. I was a freshman when the Marines uh, occupied UT in 1972. Wow. And I think I was in Ed's uh, jumping on Kentucky Fried Chicken when news came that Marcos you know, run away when we all started breaking down. So I am, in a sense, like Marites, this is our generation's way of remembering it and say, kid, you want to talk about martial law? This is what we have so far. So yeah, it not, it's not related at all to never again, because it, you know, that never again thing, you, you younger generation, have you have your own slogan? But we're not going back to the dictatorship because say, there's no polarized politics. The church is being is all bought. The church hierarchy is has been bought by Gloria Arroyo. The military is comfortable with its funding and funding, and the political clans are in power. So, ibang condition ngayon mm -hmm. JL. It's a oh, slogan that we not use. Oh nga po eh. To be honest no, about it, ah. <laughs> no, to to to. Kasi very useful din kasi nare-relate ko siya dun sa 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 four word ni Lea. Leia, the way you came up, you recounted your story uh, growing up and encountering, uh, was it your, your mom's friend who happens to be uh, the justice, etc. Iba yung context na yun, sa context ngayon. Mm. Uh, or are they just the same? Meron kasi tayong tanong na ganun eh. Um, is the geopolitical context that we are in today the same as the geopolitical context that you were in in your time when you were growing up? Yes, tanong yan ni Balbuena, how similar are world geopolitical events during the Marcos era to today's landscape, or maybe even local geopolitical events? Well, offhand, I guess the biggest difference would be the Cold War, right? And um, how that gave Marcos a lot of support from the U.S. that probably they don't care as much about what's going on here because there's so much going on internally in the U.S. now. The U.S. is not what it was. Um, and then, of course, there's the Ukraine and there's so many other things happening in the world. So, yeah, I guess that's just offhand. It's very, very different. Um, but I, I guess I don't understand, the, I guess, how do you relate that to, I guess, my personal experience growing up? Yes, well, in a way, because the thing that ni, 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 ni Joy Joy is that never again cannot work today because of the different geopolitical conditions that we are in today, maybe the young people need to come up with their different slogans. Do you share the same assessment, Leia? Or, or can we still draw never again as a, as, a, as a slogan or as a conviction? Well, I guess just speaking for, I guess from my own research, when I was working on the martial law cases, um, I think it's never again, maybe not, not the... I don't know if I'd put it that way, but if you want to yeah. change things, you want to know, you need to know what you're up against, right? And I guess when we were studying the martial law cases in law school, because of it, the, the cases were incredibly like kilometric, 500 pages for one. And then, so the way we would read them, we just sort of glossed over them and then just drew the conclusions. 
And what I really wanted to do, I guess, for my part, was to engage with the doctrinal construction. Parang, what did they really use? Because people are so dismissive. That's the problem. I think there's a lot of dismissiveness on both sides. Like, oh, that court, you know, from the one end, I guess people, they don't want to, they, um, you know, like what uh, Mike was saying, the minute they hear certain catchwords, people just shut down. By the same token, I think when um, certain arguments or, you know, certain initiatives are studied from the Marcos era, there's this tendency to also say, well, they're all corrupt. So that was all wrong. Right. So I think that's why I like Leloy's piece about currency devaluation and actually, you know, the good sides of it, because I think you need to be fair about what you're assessing. And I think in the martial law cases, what I found, I guess, was the just the legal strategy behind it. And there's actually a lot of um, it, it, it's not as crude, I guess, as what people would um, imagine. Uh, parang, there's a certain imperative that the law exerts that you need to sound, you know, coherent within it. So within, you know, there's certain checks on that. And I guess I was really interested in how it was argued. And from that, I think, I think because the problem, I mean, with law especially, I think sets the conditions of, I guess, contest in our society of, of negotiation, of debate. So if you don't know how they did it, how are you going to undo it? Or if you want to change things or you want to do it a different way. So I think there's a lot of value in studying what, what was done and how things happened exactly for any reason. But I guess to encapsulate it, even the slogan, never again, I find a little dismissive. I find a little, um, I don't know, I guess a little, sh yeah. I mean, I guess it's an easy way to say it, but I guess it needs to be a little more nuanced. And uh, yeah, so I don't know if that makes any sense, but yeah. No, it does, it does, it does. Brilliant, brilliant. I guess this is something that our audience can bring with them to their own conversations can never again still work does it work or does it not work if not why not we've got questions now streaming in regarding history as a potential subject in high school mike mike we've got a question from salu palau sobre peña why not why don't why not make martial law stories an elective subject in high school or college habang yung mga government officials natin are from the other camp Ikokonek ko na rin dyan, Mike, no, in the interest of time, yung tanong naman at comment ni Ferdinand Sanchez. Hi, Ferds. Uh, sabi niya, congrats po for the book. I hope to read it soon. Sabi niya, with the rise of the Marcoses back to power, how will this influence the retelling and assessment of the martial law era today? Should some points be more emphasized now? Let's bring them together, these two questions. You know, curriculum and whether the content should emphasize certain areas or certain themes. Maybe Mike should um, should answer that first, and then JC, and then I've got a follow up question for uh, for uh, Marites. Mike. Yeah, why not? Okay, why not go elective or going uh, actual? I mean, required uh, part of uh, the curriculum, especially sa basic ed level. Although uh, I think meron din dapat kasabay yon na parang palaging may ano ba? Uh, ongoing popularization na hindi siya ma, ma, ma fossilize eventually. And I, I'm coming from the perspective of yung Rizal Law, for instance, na it, it was diba, implemented in the 1950s and now parang hindi na siya, hindi na siya okay. Parang ano, it's simply a, a requirement, a burden. And so parang it, what yung value niya or yung original value niya is already lost. Although now, uh, ito, babagali ko dito yung bagong teleserye ng GMA7, may para may, may fresh take. So I guess kailangan may magkasabay eh. It's not just about, okay, let's include it in the curriculum and then okay na. We can, we can, we can rest and say we, we've done our share. Hindi, there, may kailangan magkasabay talaga yun, uh, both the formal curriculum and the informal curriculum outside. Because a, a lot of these people, ano eh, parang nasa, nasa background nila yung, yung pinag-aralan nila, and then they relate it with whatever they are actively consuming, whether as popular culture, man, kantang naririnig nila. So yes, okay, okay ako doon. Uh, let's, let's include it in our curriculum, especially, uh, iibahin na natin yung curriculum natin na ano eh, uh, palaging parang chart form na, okay, yes. anong ginawa ni Rojas, anong ginawa ni Quirino, anong ginawa ni Magsaysay, etc., etc. When, when you do that, inevitably, Marcos would be presented as the one doing a lot of the stuff Kasi 20 plus years siya nag, nag, naging presidente. Uh -huh. So we need to remove that. 
replace it with something that would highlight uh, the, the stories of uh, martial law victims, the stories of uh, outside of the buildings constructed, the programs, etc. But for me, okay siya, going part of the curriculum. Brilliant. I know that some of our colleagues, no, dito sa Ateneo, sina Ann Candelaria, are working with DepEd and trying to challenge no, the chronological ordering of history. No? Tama ka eh, tama ka Mike. No? Of course, given 20 years, of course, maraming nagawa talaga. No? Uh, pero if you thematize it certainly is, uh, in relation to democracy, I remember Anne was telling me, it could change the way we understand history. Iko JC, um, yung tanong ni Ferdz, no? should some points be more emphasized now? I, I, obviously, your, your question, you, you might answer that in relation to economics, but are there certain things that you feel that, hmm, maybe we should talk about this a little bit more? Mm -mm. Uh, definitely, uh, Jail, there mga punto dun sa martial economics, especially for example, yung worst post-war recession natin, yung record debt accumulation. Um, siguro a handful of things, maybe five things na key points na siguro kahit yun lang yung ma discuss. Uh, it will go a long way already to contextualize what had really happened during martial law. Pero siguro gusto ko balikan din yung tanong doon sa curriculum. Uh, I'm happy to share that actually uh, martial law economics is already an elective sa UP School of Economics. So we have already been offering this uh, to uh, uh, junior and senior students. And in fact, when I had to teach, I had the opportunity to teach this uh, back in 2017, um, marami nagsabi, ang gaganda ng feedback na parang, yung, parang gaaga nung pala. Pag, kasi kapag ka macroeconomics, for example, na puro concept, American context, hindi nila ma-appreciate. Pero kapag ka, ah, nangyari pala ito sa Pilipinas, pwede mo pala na, may mga, may mga nangyari pala sa history natin na perfect example ng, for example, Central Bank Independence, uh, yung, uh, yung uh, recessions and how to um, avoid them, um, nako-contextualize. So yung ganong classing marriage between teaching economics and history, I really found it to be really quite instructive and useful. And uh, ayun, sana mapalagaan na pa. Uh, especially, well, I, I'm not sure kung uh, okay ng ituro ang martial economics sa high school level as, a, as part of the curriculum, pero siguro may paraan para isama din yun sa high school level. But why not? Why not, JC? Why not? Definitely, why not? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, actually, actually, yeah, tama. Actually, walang hadlang para maituro yung martial economics at the high school level. Uh, pero tulad ng sinabi ng, ni Marites sa uh, ito ba yung panahon or parang willing ba yung mga kinauukulan na isama uh, iyon? Uh, ano struggles? Ano yung political economy? Gano kadali or kahirap i i isama yun sa curriculum? Yun yung next uh, questions doon. Kaya, kaya nga napapaisip ako na parang um um by always thinking about the curriculum, aren't we um, thinking of education as a panacea? To solve education, meaning formal education, as the panacea. I think maganda yung point ni Mike dito, eh, na, na there are many other ways of educating the public. No? Diba education has to formal and informal. Formal meaning schooling and the informal meaning socialization in other, in other places. Um, and I suppose the work that you're doing, JC, no, sa, as, as a public intellectuals, public econ economists are very, uh, very, very helpful. Okay, let's shift gears. Um, Almira, just give us an, just a, give us a go signal if we can extend by a few more minutes. Uh, the questions keep piling up. But we have important questions about BARM. No? Um, ayun natin tong pakawalan. Sabi ni Ana Maria uh, Goetz or Goetz. Uh, G-O-E-T-Z. Hi, Ana Marie. Congrats on this timely volume, sabi niya. Question for Marites and Giorgio. What does the attempted erasure of the historical record of the Jabida massacre signal about the PBBM administration's commitment or approach to peace in the barn? Marites, let's hear from you first. <clears throat> yeah, um, medyo nahirapan ako kasi I did not follow the barn process, but I think... Uh, Ang perception ko, ang sense ko kay Ferdinand Marcos Jr. is that uh, he he showed his commitment naman to Barm when he in the when he went I think to Mindanao and then he presided over the uh, induction of the officers. Ang tingin ko itong pag uh, whitewash sa Jabi the massacre ay during the campaign is just to give an image 
na to make the myth na ang si the Marcoses his father did not um, stoke the conflict in Mindanao. So yun yung parang nahihiwalay ko siya na it was a campaign strategy para maging mabango siya. But ngayon uh, since ito na siya na yung presidente at andiyan na yung uh, peace process na nangyayari sabi ng mga nakausap ko naman sa Mindanao there, there's he has not uh, been a hindrance so ibig sabihin uh, he has supported the peace process so Jojo what do you think um, I think the attempt to uh, thank you for your question Anne Marie the, I think the erasure of Jabida is very much related to a larger story which is the Marco, first that the Marcos dictatorship first failure to consolidate had something to do with the fact that by 1975 a powerful Moro National Liberation Front almost defeated the Philippine military in Mindanao. Fantastic. Uh, the, the fearful memoir of General Abbott by entitled and Liberia is that the day we almost lost Mindanao. The second one is that the reaction of the regime to Mindanao was to practically born holo. Okay? The trauma in its households had to go through when the city, the historic city, was burned by the Philippine Navy and the army just to save it from the MNLF. It's also, and which leads me to the second point, which is they almost got defeated by the Muslims, and the war in Mindanao was one of the bloodiest the country ever went through since World War II. We're thinking about 50,000 killed, over a million people, I think, at that era, displaced. No? Uh, so it remains a very traumatic event in the history of Filipino Muslims, of Muslims. Okay? And even up to now, actually, when I was doing field work sa Mindanao in 2008, I asked people sa, you know, sa Cotabato, ano ho yung imagination yun ng national state? Yung sabi nila, well, the national state is the, this guy in uniform shooting at my children. Okay? It's a very traumatic event. Uh, and so if you erase and say fake ang Jabeda massacre, then do you negate the rationale of the MNLF rebellion, which was this genocidal campaign accordingly waged by the Philippine government, Filipino colonialism, and Christian sectors to eliminate Muslims. So, ibig sabihin, kung hindi totoo ang Jabida, hindi totoo ang MNLF Rebellion, hindi totoo ang MNLF Rebellion, para kipa, di ba? Which then goes back to the idea that in the long run, if you go further deeper, it says, ito mga Muslims talaga walang ginagawa, kundi ibang gulo lang. Di ba? Correct. Correct. Well, in fact, these are very, very, you know, very, these are very principled people, people, peasants who left the farms to go to Libya and Malaysia to train to fight the army. So you negate the struggle of the Filipino people. Okay. Now, the second interesting thing about this Jabida massacre is they're attacking, say, Marites Bitog and Glenda Gloria for saying, well, it's really false. You know what's, what's absent? The Muslim voice. And the beauty of Marites and Glenda's chapter is they really went and they went there and said, can you tell us what happened? None of these critics, Miss Marcos included, have ever done that. Because if she does that, then Muslim communities in Holo, in Cotabato, would say, Bakit niyo pinagpapatay yung mga anak na mga dati na nanay namin? Under the name of National the New Society. So, this is a very interesting attempt to undermine, to undercut the historic struggles of the Muslims. Yun lang. Thank you for that powerful reminder, Giorgio. No, yung erasures na ito, yung mga historical distortions na ito are not, are not um, parang inconsequential <laughs> um, distortions, if you will. No? Meron silang um, powerful implications on how we understand the rest of our history. And mm -hmm. personally, no, because of my own work also among young people mm -hmm. sa Marawi, aware din ako na, um, of the, how these things can, can play out you know, in their own consciousness about their marginalization and exclusion um, and the national imaginary.
Basahin ko lang ang mga very encouraging remarks of our audience. Sabi ni Colleen, we are listening and we will continue to listen. Salamat Ateneo Press, looking forward to reading the book. Sabi naman, uh, uh, marami nagsasabi ng mga very positive. Si Angelito David, good afternoon po, kudos. Uh, si Giolo Putong, uh, sabi niya, excited to purchase. Uh, good job, Ateneo. Badges. Yeah. So, so thank you so much for those very positive and encouraging words. Uh, natutuwa po kami na hindi lang pala kami ang nag-uusap-usap sa libro nito. Meron pala mga interesado mga, mga magbasa uh, sa, 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 sa mga sinulat namin. Leah, maybe this, goes, uh, this question is for you. We have a pahabal question. Uh, sabi, sabi nitong tanong nito, since people's attention span, so ang, as, ang assumption niya ay maikli lang ang attention span ng mga tao is only 10 seconds or 1 minute, how do we new ones? Should we justify? Should we just then simplify? I have to admit, okay, just uh, I have yeah. not really given this, the, the approaches. I don't live in the Philippines. So I don't actually encounter a lot of people. That, I'm not on the front lines like Mike and JC are. Um, but I guess just speaking for, for myself, from my own conversations, I guess what I try to do is acknowledge the complexity of, yeah. of the issues. And then I, I, I guess I just try to just talk about, well, yeah, you can, you know, just say, I have to, I, I just acknowledge, I guess, that, that there's no simple, um, you can't reduce it to a soundbite. I don't know if that's really the solution to, to reduce it to a soundbite. Um, but maybe leave it hanging and maybe that opens up um, curiosity and you know, it'll pique their interest rather than you know, just feeding them what you think they need to know. Maybe just provoke thought is what I would do. Yeah. 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 No, ma'am, I agree with you. Um, um, I join, if I may just, you know, just a, for, for, for a few seconds, I'm part of um, the lead, this leadership boot camp, series of leadership boot camps organized by DOST for their own science scholars, undergraduate students. So every other week, I join them in different parts of the country. And the topic is youth participation, democracy, citizenship, and I would talk about what's the role of young people in democracy today. You know? And then with just that one question, it's yung one hour and a half, you know, students talking about um, their own disappointments and issues and questions about the past and so forth. Hindi ako sure kung kaya siya ng 10 minutes lang eh. Definitely not, no? And I suppose maybe the, ako, if I were to answer this question, parang hindi eh, baka spaces for conversations. Really, no? For, for good and deep conversations. Kasi marami naman nagtatanong eh. I'm sure JC knows this very well, you know, given his extensive work around uh, the country as well. And ikaw, Mike, how would you answer that question? Can you TikTok history? Can you, uh, can you, uh, is it worth doing that? I'm sure there are many public historians who are doing that. We know them. May mga gumagawa that, na. Oh, <laughs> TikTok yeah, yeah, historians, yeah, may mga gumagawa na. Uh, but uh, to, 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 to answer that question uh, regarding yung 10 seconds uh, attention span, for me personally, hindi ako convinced na uh, stale na yung never again slogan. And, and I mean, sl slogan as yung negative concept ng slogan na parang sloganeering, napaka-simplistic. It, it serves us for a certain purpose. Eh. Diba? Hindi naman lahat ng manifestos ay babasahin na as is. In the same way that textbooks cannot be written as diba, nuanced academic works. May kanya-kanyang audience yan. Eh. You, you can turn every historical film into a, a well-researched uh, primary source driven book. And ganun din, slogans, kasi iba yung, iba yung audio sa slogan, it's meant for mobilization. So, it, it's meant to be simplistic. Uh, pero, kailangan, lalagyan mo rin ng iba pa. So, aside from slogan, anong kasabay ng slogan? May libro, may pelikula, may chit-chat, may TikTok. Uh, it, it, it needs something else. So, for me, Kung if, if never again is no long is, is passe, it's, it's, it's no longer powerful, then the question, next question is, what do we replace it with? So, so, so sa akin, ah. we, we still need certain keywords sa parang pag yun, we can mobilize people. Slogans, for me, are still powerful. Pero going back to your point kanina, Mike, 
hindi ba yung mga slogans na yan, they shut people down? So, parang, yeah, ano, ay, nga, iba, iba, iba naman yung purpose niya. I mean, may iba-ibang tao. May ibang tao na shut down. May ibang tao, they, they are more, more open to, you know, watching something na TikTok. May ibang tao, more open to watching na documentary. So, uh, u- 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 lahat ng po- possible weapons in the armory, kung po pwede natin dalhin dyan, dalhin natin. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. JC, do you agree? Actually, I agree. Um, sinubukan ko mag-TikTok myself and I found it really quite difficult. Um, dati, meron pa ako mga 3-minute TikToks tapos paikli siya ng paikli. At habang paikli siya ng paikli, ay patagal ng patagal ko siyang ginagawa. So yung 1-minute na TikTok, for example, I can easily take up an hour or an hour and a half just to do it kasi ako mismo nahihirapan dun sa user interface ni TikTok. Um, pero as public intellectuals and scholars and journalists, um, ano eh, parang uh, what I would suggest is that we provide our audiences a menu of products of varying levels of depth. So aside from, of course, we have the anthology, um, pero I can only hope, for example, na young people uh, make TikTok videos out of it, Siguro may mga YouTube videos uh, and then uh, ayun eh parang uh, iba't ibang klase ng uh, parang iba't ibang intellectual products for different um, audiences. And I think dun sa uh, TikTok videos for example, um, okay na na ma-pick mo yung interest nila eh, as uh, Leia mentioned. And uh, siguro yun yung window para mag-explore pa sila by themselves na ah interesting to ah parang siguro maghanap pa sila ng additional material. So it's a lot of hard work, pero given the current uh, information ecosystem that we live in, we may have no choice. Eh. Um, ang hirap bitawan yung ganitong klaseng platforms na hindi pwedeng wala tayo sa YouTube, hindi pwedeng wala tayo sa TikTok or Twitter or Facebook right. o kung ano man. Especially among us na uh, yung mga bosses natin and we have something to contribute to the conversation. Um, ayun yeah. eh. Uh, ay, so yun, sana may TikTok out of this uh, Marcos era book. <laughs> Siguro, uh, can I just say something? Siguro, yes, gurang please. na ako nito. Pero ang image ko of this conversation actually is nagtatagayan tayo sa kanto ng Katipunan at Aurora Boulevard. <laughs> <laughs> yung, yung, one of my beautiful images in the 80s was I mean, Rian Alejandro would go to that corner and just listen to taxi drivers talk about everything from the existence of God to the size of Imelda's legs. So it's conversation. The other book, actually, that really inspired me, which is, yeah, you can do TikTok social media. At the end of the day, it's still conversation that's important. Kung yeah. nabasa niyo yung, you know, yung jalad-jalad ni Marites Vito, have you ever, are you, have you ever read her book? She and Chris Yabes wrote this wonderful book about the two of them going around Southeast Asia, jalad-jalad. That's a classic conversation that you get. I mean, for me, when I read that book, that's when I realized we're Southeast Asians. It wasn't, a, it wasn't an academic book. It wasn't James Warren. It wasn't, you know, Cesar Abid mm-hmm. Mahol. It's just two journalists, Marites Vitog and Chris Hilda Yavis, going around Borneo and Bib Iaga and chatting with people and then realizing that there is this regional thing. And I think the, the big problem really is TikTok may be a young generation, but much of people remembering our story is oral and it has to come to conversation yeah. no yeah. it's like my students are saying oh bakit ko kayo nawala <laughs> sa pilipinas or or me encountering actually a janitor here na ilocano who fought in mindanao no? or encountering this imam in 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 cotabato city who was this one of the two first second two 100 cadres of the mnlf that's who were sent to libya to learn how anti-tank warfare, anti-tank battle, and being taught by East German, you know, East German you know, specialists. So these guys moved around. They have their stories to tell. Pero yun lang nga, you know, TikTok uh, derails that. And we, the way we can compensate for that is to sit yeah. down and be like really good journalists and listen to them. So now, the young people, I encourage you to read their book, Yung Jalan Jalan nila ni it's a kind of crazy. It's a classic, you know, way of doing yeah. teamwork. work. Yeah. Parang sa Bisaya, di ba? Suri suri, no? Suri suri. Suri suri, no? You mean jalan jalan, me? Malakad lakad. Yeah, jalan jalan. Like, you know, like you know, my, my my dissertation was the result of conversations with old people, old Muslims who weirdly had New Jersey accents. 
<laughs> kasi yung first teachers na were American soldiers. Like, where is this coming from? So the curiosity, yeah. I think, is there. Um, yes. And we just have to start con- talking to people, including people we disagree. I had this wonderful conversation this afternoon with my student who is the niece of Chavit Singson. You know, <laughs> like, wow, this is the niece of Chavit Singson. Is my student here, Rosa. You know, very pro-Marcos, very pro-Duterte, very pro-Trump. But it's an interesting conversation we had. Uh, I know. Uh, so I think I think it's more important than just you know social media. I yeah. think like it's as Mike pointed out, it's a multi-pronged thing, uh, and hopefully this small contribution, small yeah. book is you know will help in that conversation. So Tagayana. <laughs> <laughs> From Jolan Jolan to Tagayan. Yeah yeah uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks, Giorgio. Maganda ang sinasabi ni Jed Baluyat Aligado. Sabi niya, congrats, Admo Press, editors and contributors. Excited to have a copy oh, of the book. book. So, salamat. Thank salamat you. kayo, Jed. Let's wrap things up. Final words from all of your, your, your final words for our audience. Many of them are still very much engaged. Pero kung, if, if you could somehow comment on, on this particular issue, I want to bring this up kasi... So thinking ko, this is really the crux of the matter today. The credibility of public intellectuals. We are all public intellectuals, one way or another, right? Journalists, scholars writing for Rappler, scholars engaging um, different students around the country. We yeah. are, no? Yeah. Pero, may I, uh, pero I wonder if we are still the credible people that, pe- that the public can listen to. May I ask you to comment on that as you give your final remarks? Um, and whether there is still a place for for deep and nuanced and 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 really um, good conversations about the Marcos era and about our politics today, shall we start with our um, let's start with JC. Let's start with our contributors and then we'll end with the editors. JC, you want to start? Thank you, Jail. Um... Ang napansin ko lang in the past couple of years is that um, the government has increased its attack its attacks on journalists, um, especially in the uh, Duterte administration. Pero they have shifted gears to attack public intellectuals um, in the past couple of months, I would say. Um, parang yun ang phase two ng kanilang operations, as it were. Uh, and it's unfortunate... Um, on the one hand, pero on the other hand, I'm also encouraged by this new uh, SWS survey um, released just yesterday, I think, na nagpapakita na actually um, parang 4% lang ng mga sinurvey ng SWS ang nagsasabi na uh, public intellectuals ay source ng disinformation or fake news. Um, by and large, yung pa rin talaga mga social media influencers. Although, of course, you might say na uh, in these days, my intersection na between public intellectuals and social, and, uh, social media, uh, media in, um, uh, parang, uh, influencers. Um, pero ayun eh, I'm still heartened by the fact na marami pa rin naniniwala sa public intellectuals pero we have to be on our guard uh, kasi parang they're after us na. Um, so we ha- really have to help each other out. Uh, we have to uh, uh, close the ranks and well, not close the ranks pero really just uh, uh, look out for each other um, kasi napaka-perilous ng environment natin sa ngayon, uh, napaka-toxic ng conversations and uh, um Ayun, parang we just have to uh, stand our ground. Thank you, Jail. And sana basahin niyo ang book. Thank you. Yes. Magkasama tayo dyan, JC. Maraming salamat sa message of solidarity. Mike, your turn. Yes, yeah, sa akin, uh, may dalawang side rin siya. Eh, na on, on the one hand, yes, it's uh, uh, it's a threat na may ganitong mga nangyayari, dis- discrediting public intellectuals, journalists, historians. But on the other hand, it's also a challenge for us who are part of the academe, part of quote-unquote mainstream press, to also uh, interrogate our position. Meron ba talagang inherent na, na privilege for us to speak on behalf of the masses or on behalf of the Filipino people? Baka nga naman may, 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 may laman yung mga, yung mga interrogations, yung mga accusations. Pero yun, okay? it, it shouldn't stop us. Uh, from uh, from uh, widening the discourse kasi yun naman talaga dapat yung mangyayari sa atin okay hindi tayo papayag dapat na uh, this 
at atmosphere of anti-intellectualism would lead uh, to yun nga, the criminalization of dissenting acts of dissenting forms of knowledge. So, pwede natin siguro gamitin ito in order for us to be able to connect na yung mga nangyayari during the Marcos era, Marcos senior era, seems like nangyayari pa rin ngayon. So, talagang relevant pa rin yung pag-aralan yung kasaysayan. So, siguro yun lang sa akin yung take ko regarding uh, that issue and uh, sana ay bumili kayo nung libro ito. Maraming salamat, Mike. Alam namin na may klase ka ngayon at nagpakalingin ka sa klase ko <laughs> ngayon. Sana nunod yung mga estudyante ko. <laughs> <laughs> salamat, Mike, for that empowering message. Thank you. Marites, it's your turn. Yes, I think the survey na nire-refer ni JC was conducted by Pulse Asia wherein dito bad news for journalists. Pero he, this is not surprising because uh, nag-umpisa na ito kay Duterte pa. So tuloy-tuloy lang. Ang, ang results ng Pulse Asia survey, 40% of the respondents uh, consider journalists as the source of fake news. So baliktad na ang mundo. Uh, very challenging. Maraming uh, difficulties ngayon. Pero we have to continue doing our work, which is to uh, report the facts. And we have, ngayon kasi, um, I, I'm I'm quite old. I'm, I'm not the social media uh, type of journalist. But now I realize, which I did during the com- election campaign, was I also did TikTok with the help of uh, producers in Raptor. So we have to compete sa platforms na pinupuntahan ng mga bata at ng mga younger generation. So yun lang, there's um, this, uh, I was very sad uh, ito sa result ng survey na ang baba na ng tingin sa journalist na dati noble profession, uh, we bear witness to truth, uh, reporting from the field. Ngayon, purveyors na kami of fake news. And this is the product of um, this information also starting from Duterte's time. And under President Marcos, nung kampanya, he undermined also the mainstream media by not talking to us, by not giving us access. So yun, um, there's a lot of things to do, but we just have to keep doing our work. Good. Good. Maraming maraming salamat, Marites. Yun din na napansin ko, kita ko rin na uh, yung credibility ng mga journalists doon. Eh. Parang, in fact, ikaw ang una ko naisip. <laughs> ikaw ang una ko, ikaw ang una ko naisip na nakita ko yung survey data sa mga kasama natin sa Rappler. But really, thank you. Thank you for that. All right, let's turn to our uh, editors. Leia, final words from you, please. Well, well, that's a really, really great question, Jayul. And it actually made me think of a larger issue beyond just this whole martial law book. And I guess it's about public discourse in general and access, I think that maybe the decline in the stature and credibility of public intellectuals also has to do with the ability to access the public in the first place. And that, you know, with the rise of with the internet, parang everybody can be an expert now, right? Parang we have lost the gatekeepers. I guess there was some kind of um, deference given to public intellectuals who were published because there was a certain process that you needed to get through in order for your your views to see the light. But that's no longer the case now. There's no more gatekeepers. So in a way, um, people have to function as their own gatekeepers. And um, maybe not everybody is equipped to do that. Um, so when I think about like how, how, to, to, how to deal with that, I think everybody's ideas, um, um, especially being aware of your audiences, engaging on different fronts um and maybe i guess just being wary of orthodoxies in general because i guess in the the what i'm seeing is a lot of skepticism uh towards expertise in general but maybe um it should translate to a, a wariness about you know this whole um push to impose orthodoxies because i guess on the u.s side one complaint is that Parang the mainstream media represents only one point of view as well. So maybe it's healthy that there's, if, if, I mean, from my perspective, come, you know, f- f- being here, I do, it, it might be healthy in the long run to have different voices aired on the Philippine side. And I guess you just have to be, we just have to be more vigilant 
and just keep at it. Um, you know, keep putting your voices out there, um, maybe in careful ways, because you know, with the risks that um, are at, at, um, that that come with it. But I think, on the other hand, you don't want an environment also that imposes thought, uh, certain points of view. So I guess you know, a good mix, a good balance would be good. I thought it was very wise, uh, Leia, a good balance, you know, a careful balance, not being overprotective, not being too imposing, really a healthy discourse, a healthy discussion. Again, the theme, it goes back to what we have been talking about the whole time, conversations. Maraming maraming salamat, Leia. Uh, the last words, uh, <laughs> the last remarks will come from Giorgio, uh, also our editor. Yeah, Thanks, I, I, I think we have to admit that people will hate us because for two things. We, what we say is something that will make people uncomfortable. It's not only people in power who are uncomfortable, but people who are comfortable with what their lives are. Right? So if you look at history, intellectuals and journalists are the first to go. No? Mao Zedong told intellectuals, Stalin did the same thing, Hitler did the same thing. So we always have to start with the fact that we start with very limited audience because everybody is suspicious of us, yeah? Right, no? Because you, you, you think of speak to to power, you speak to the power, power will arrest, have you arrested and killed. But also if you speak truth to the people, people will be uncomfortable, you know? Because that's what you say. Well, what your life, what we're tale, writing about is that to show you that this is not normal. What you consider as a normal life is not normal. And people are poor, kids are dying, etc. So I think we have to start with that. That in the end, actually, people will hate us. The majority will hate us, and that the most likely people who will there will be a smaller percentage of people, however, who will listen to us. And this, for me, comes from fifty years of teaching, which is you have a class of fifty students, only one will come back and say, "I learned something from you," and I think. We have, well, we can be, you know, we can dream that everybody will listen to us. We also have to be realistic with the fact that when we write, we write to make people uncomfortable. And when people are uncomfortable, they tend to shun us. And the challenge then is to continue it to a point where a small percentage of people who read and listen to us will say, That is what the sort of like the narrow world of the public intellectual is. So I'm hoping this book will do that. No, people will hate it. People, some people will not read it. Some will people just scan it. I doubt if majority of our readers will read it from page to from page one to page twenty. But hopefully, it's there to sort of bother them, to bother everyone. Not only those who are pro Marcos, but also, more importantly, those anti Marcos because. Uh, you know, the history of that 15 years of darkness that we had to go through, which destroyed basically two generations. So, yun lang. And I hope you guys read the book. Uh, you know, we hope to come up with more books and interesting books in the future. These young scholars, these young academics, these young public intellectuals are sure to, you know, come back with better analysis, assessment of history. And so, you know, in our old age, you know, it's good to say, yeah, we did something before we crop. Maraming salamat. So, Giorgio, those are very, very wise words, and I suppose many, many in the audience can resonate with that, and I hope that that will resound in the days and the years to come. Salamat kaayo sa atong tanan, sa atong mga yeah, panelists, sa atong mga, sa atong mga audiences from around the country and maybe in different parts of the world, wherever you are. Salamat kaayo. Thank you so much for joining us in this conversation. Yeah. Uh, we want to encourage you, as we have time and again, that uh, you please read the book. Get a copy of the book. Um, Ateneo Press um, says that it will be available. The pre-orders have already closed. Um, um, and now they are <laughs> committing that, uh, they are committing that uh, it will be available via their website and online stores. Um, uh, for purchase starting next week. We do have some questions about ebooks, no ebook versions, Ateneo Press, maybe. Uh, yun. So good news uh, for you all, yeah. for all of you there. 
in other parts of the world, there will be e-books in the coming months. E-books mm-hmm. will come in the coming months. Pero kung hindi kayo makapaghintay, aba, bumili na kayo, uh, magpa-deliver na lang kayo sa mga kaibigan ninyo from Manila, pa-DHL kayo. No, but in any case, yeah, at least may commitment. And now I can tell the world. You know, that, um, so print muna, then, uh, then e-book version next. Okay? Um, hopefully, uh, this book, this publication, ladies and gentlemen, uh, folks, will inspire conversations. Again, that word I we heard again and again uh, throughout these two hours. Um, we hope that you will not give up on these conversations. Not everybody will be convinced, as Giorgio has rightly put it, and I agree with him uh, that we write to make people uncomfortable. And if a few people um, realize uh, the wisdom in some of our writings, then we have done our part. Um, at least before we, we depart this world. <laughs> <laughs> so, maraming, maraming salamat for, uh, for, for that very sobering remark, Jojo. I know. And a sobering <laughs> remark for all of us, you know, um, dito. It's the alcohol. Right. Uh, and the It's the wine. <laughs> it's a Tagayan. It's a Tagayan, yeah. From Jalan, Jalan, Tagayan, and then, yeah, all these all these wise words that can only come from a, a seasoned man like uh, Giorgio. Giorgio, Lea, Marites, JCA, and uh, Mike, salamat kayo. Maraming salamat sa inyo. Thank, yeah, salamat thank din, you so much for moderating. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Almira. And hope to see you soon on these days. Hope we broaden the conversation. Yes, broaden, yes. I think, broaden the conversation. I think we have. All right, ingat po kayong lahat. Uh, mula sa Good morning. Atin, uh, ingat kayong lahat and take care and pagkutuloy lang natin ang mga conversations okay. nito. Magandang gabi po Bye-bye. sa inyo. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Good morning. Congratulations. <laughs> Sakto, two hours. Sakto. Sakto, two hours? Yeah, that's good. Sakto, yeah.